Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly Stevens. I'm a teacher and author, and this is English Nerd. So if you are watching this, you've probably seen some of the rest of the All About Dante's Inferno series. Today we are talking, or I am talking about Canto 26 and 27. It's Bolgia 8 in Circle 8. So there are 10 Bolgias or ditches within Circle 8, which is all about different types of fraud. Last time I talked about the thieves and the, how they morph into different serpents and whatnot. You can check out that video if you haven't already. And today it's the evil counselors, at least that is how my translation says it. So without further ado, let's, let's dive on in, which I shouldn't say when I'm teaching the Inferno. I, I didn't even mean, I didn't even mean to do that. All right, so I'm using my janky school copy because I teach this in high school. In fact, uh, now I'm actually teaching it to my high schoolers. When I started this series, I was not teaching Inferno in, at the same time, but now, now I am, so. All right, Bolgia 8, uh, Canto 26, begins with Dante talking about how Florence is just rife with fraud and how they should be ashamed of themselves. And it's no surprise that one of the reasons Dante wrote this story is to call out the evils that he saw politically um, among the spiritual leaders etc. So that is uh, what goes on for the first few stanzas of this section. But then Dante and Virgil make their way, it says, among these rocks, which I have to think Eliot took for his poem um, Ash Wednesday because the, the wording is very similar and T.S. Eliot, as you'll see at the end of this video, like to take from Dante's Inferno. And so that was just one phrase that I thought maybe he, maybe he took. But more importantly, Dante and Virgil arrive and look down at Bolgia 8, which is for the evil counselors. My translation says this line 31 and onward. Such myriads of flames I saw shine through the gloom of that eighth abyss when I arrived at the rim from which its bed comes into view. So uh, it, at first it's described as fireflies and then here we have the, these myriad flames. So I picture these like gigantic candle flames and I think that's the way that it's supposed to be pictured because later on when the flames begin to speak, it says that the, the tip kind of flickers and so it just, it's, it's easy to picture as this, these big candle flames down there um, forever. So these flames forever passing by were visible ahead to right to left. For though each steals a sinner's soul from view, not one among them leaves a trace of the theft. That's around line 40, um, a little before and after. So the souls in this section are not s separated from the punishments, but are encased in it. The last time we saw this in Dante's Inferno was round two of circle seven. Those who had taken their own lives are trees. Here it seems possible that there are human bodies, but they're encased in these flames. And the only way they can speak is through the flickering of the flames. And so there's, there's this sense of, as it says, theft. So something is not what it seems to be. There's no trace of a, sin, of a soul to be seen, uh, the physical body that is. And so there's, there's something deceptive, which fits the idea of being an evil counselor, which we learn is giving ruinous advice, making plans for ruination of others. Um, really, those are, the, those are the, two, the two ways of describing what these people are all about. All right. Um, so Dante, asks about one particular flame that seems kind of bigger than the others. It's like two people kind of put together almost because of course Dante is trying to find either people from his homeland or people who are interesting to talk to to get a sense of what these people have done. And it says line 55, he, that is Virgil, the guide, answered me, forever around this path 
Ulysses and Diomede move in such dress united in pain as once they were in wrath. There they lament the ambush of the horse, which was the door through which the noble seed of the Romans issued from its holy source. So Ulysses and Diomede, Ulysses is the one that Dante is really interested in. That's just another name for Odysseus. So Odysseus of the Odyssey, and um, in this case, Virgil is referring to um, events in the Iliad um, as well. <clears throat> Actually, no, it's, um, well, I, take I take that back. We learn about the Trojan horse in the Aeneid. But in any case, so these two planned the whole Trojan horse situation together, Diomede and Ulysses, and so they're united um, for that and for a couple other ways that they had plotted. And uh, Dante is, is pretty firmly on the side of, of the Trojans on, in that conflict between the Trojans and the Greeks, which makes sense because he's such a Virgil fanboy and Aeneas was a Trojan who escaped from the flames and, and founded Rome. I love what happens next. It <laughs> says line 64, right after Virgil says who they are in those particular flames. Line 64, Master, I cried, I pray you and repray till my prayer becomes a thousand. If these souls can still speak from the fire, oh, let me stay until the flame draws near. Do not deny me. You see how fervently I long for it. He goes full on fanboy. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. He hears that Odysseus is over there, Ulysses, and he's like, which, which, that, that one over there, please, 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 let me talk to him. I mean, he's begging, begging Virgil to allow him to have this conversation that maybe he never thought would be possible in a million years. There aren't that many laugh out loud moments in the comedy. But honestly, this one, this one always gets me. I think it's just <laughs> fantastic. So Virgil allows it, and Dante is super excited. He goes up and speaks to um, speaks to Ulysses. There's the only way that they can speak is through the the flickering of that that flame. So contrapasso, wise contrapasso means the punishment fits the crime, of course is that there is an element of deception in this punishment, just like there was an element of deception in their actions, and their sin related to the way that they spoke, you know, just dis destructive things. And so now they're this tongue of flame and their speaking is affected by the parameters of their punishment. So there are a couple ways that this is a uh, contrapasso. There are more than that, but that's a an idea for you. So Ulysses tells this story. It's interesting that Virgil does not choose a story that comes from Homer or Virgil or any of those great epic poets. You'd think he could draw from those, but instead the story that Ulysses tells is one that Dante completely made up that's brand new and it is eventually going to be the inspiration for Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. Um, who also does not refer to Homer or Virgil, but instead refers to Dante's fictional account of what Ulysses did after he returned home to Ithaca at the end of, of the Odyssey. I have a whole video about Tennyson's Ulysses if you want to check that out. Um, but it says, after Ulysses got back to Ithaca at the end of the Odyssey, that um, not fondness for my son, nor reverence for my aged father, this is line 88 is where I started, or 89, nor Penelope's claims to the joys of love could drive out of my mind the lust to experience the far-flung world and the failings and felicities of mankind. I put out on the high and open sea with a single ship and only those few souls who stayed true when the rest deserted me. So he got back to Ithaca and unsurprisingly, because of all of his adventures and the way that his mind's always going, he got bored and decided he wanted to leave. Those bonds of home could not keep him back. And so he decided he would sail to just the end of the world. Basically, he tells the rest of the story and he brings some, some sailors with him on this ill-fated voyage. 
So at the end of this canto, canto 26, it says line 124. Um, finally, we sighted dark in space, a peak so tall I doubted any man had seen the like. Our tears were hardly sounded when a squall broke hard upon our bow from the new land. Um, and then the, the ship just immediately goes down. The peak that he talks about seeing is the Mount of Purgatory. Purgatory, which is the second leg of Dante's journey, it's that in-between space in the afterlife where people can um, be purged from their sins and will eventually make it to paradise, um, but maybe not for hundreds of years. So you're not allowed to just climb Purgatory unless you have the permission of God himself, like Dante has with um, through Virgil and, and Beatrice. So that's how far Odysseus has sailed. If you look at Dante's cosmology, the way that he kind of creates the earth and the afterlife and everything, it's a little bit complicated, but part of it relies on the idea that the Mount of Purgatory is a physical place that is on earth. Um, so just like the inferno is a physical place you go down into the earth, M the Mount of Purgatory is on the other side of the world going, of course, up. So Odysseus, his ruinous advice was to, uh, to bring all these, or take all these other people from Ithaca on this journey that um, he never should have taken in the first place. It was borderline blasphemous. Um, in, in Dante's view, you know, he's, he's not allowed to just climb up to paradise. And that's why the ship goes down immediately. It's, it's the wrath of, of God. So it's a pretty fascinating story. And again, I would recommend that you read Tennyson's Ulysses if you haven't read it already. It's about three pages and it's beautiful and actually really inspiring, even though it's based on this story that's meant to be seen as a bad thing. Okay, that brings us to Canto 27, which is still the evil counselors, Bolgia 8. The, uh, only, only the grafters and the thieves have gotten to Canto so far in Circle 8. Here is um, another one. So I don't tend to speak as uh, in at length about this particular Canto, so I'll just hit some of the the points that I find the most interesting. Dante moves on from speaking to Ulysses and runs into a guy that just recently passed away. Guido de Montefeltro is his name. And uh, Count Guido was somebody who counseled Pope Boniface VIII. Pope Boniface VIII was the one who exiled Dante. Dante has a very strong personal beef with Pope Boniface VIII. Um, he said that he he belonged in in uh, Circle Eight as well in Bolivia Three. So here's somebody who counseled Pope Boniface VIII, but who was tricked basically into giving ruinous advice. So the Pope said, how can I destroy the, this, this one family that was kind of going against him? And, and Count Guido said, I really don't think I should, <laughs> I should uh, give you all the means to destroy them. And the Pope said that he would forgive anything retroactively, uh, not retroactively, but um, I guess proactively before Guido gave him that advice. Essentially, he said, you're forgiven. It's no big deal. I'm the Pope. I can do what I want. And then Guido told him how to destroy that family, thinking that he was free and clear, but he never actually repented for what he had done. And so he gets thrown into the inferno. At first, it looks like he's going to go up to heaven, but then his soul is reclaimed by the inferno because he didn't repent for the evil things that he had done um, after he did them. This is, um, so I know I just kind of skimmed right over the, the text there, which I, I don't generally like to do, but again, it's not one that I focus on in class because with Ulysses, I think you get the, the meat of what this Bolgi is all about. Last thing I'll say is that um, in Canto 27 line, 
58, we reach the first person, I believe it's the first person, who does not want to be remembered. The souls up to this point, many of them have asked Dante to remember them, to maybe write a book about them. Um, they don't say it that way, but please tell our story when you get back to the land of the living, is what many of them say, starting with uh, Chiaco, I believe, in Circle 3. But here we find, again, I think the first person who says, I do not want to be remembered, and the only reason I'm telling you my name is because I don't think you'll make it back. I'm going to read it for you. This is, again, line 58. Guido says, If I believed that my reply were made to one who could ever climb to the world again, this flame would shake no more. But since no shade ever returned, if what I am told is true, from this blind world into the living light, without fear of dishonor, I answer you. So this guy doesn't think that Dante is going to make it out alive, which has to be a little bit discouraging for him, but Dante has had not only Virgil's assurance that this is the will of God, the heavenly messenger confirmed it, um, but also there was that encounter with Brunetto Latino in Circle 7 who said, follow your star, and if I'm right, and I think I am, you're going to make it all the way to paradise. So he's had a lot of encouragement, but here Guido does not think he's going to make it. Those lines that I just read for you in the original Italian are the um, epigraph for the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is another poem by T.S. Eliot that is more well known. And I have a video about that poem as well. I love it. It's one of my all time favorites. It references the Inferno, it references Hamlet, it references so many of the things that I love in a really unique way. So if you haven't checked that one out, then I would. Okay, that is it. Next time we will go to the next Bolgia, and we're almost out of out of the weeds here in Circle 8, which is just absolutely gigantic. All right, that is it for today. Make sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like this video if you like it, and I'll see you next time.